So you, you can kind of see that here is our Hawaii island in the southeast. And if we look to the next island over, Maui doesn't look that big, right? But you actually can look that if we rewind time back to one and a half, 1.2 million years ago, that there is a much bigger landmass that's been termed Maui Nui, Great Maui, that actually connects this whole landmass of Maui and Molokai and Lanai and Kaho Olavi. All of that. That's all Maui Nui. And in fact, even this little branch out to here. Right? And so that was a shape of Maui Nui. So that is a pretty big island as well. Not that different in shape and size from what we have here. Maybe rotated a little bit, but. Right, and here you can see a little easier, more easily see Mahukona Volcano undersea, northwest of Hawaii Island right there. So the islands are sinking, but you have to really account for not just what you see above the water with this effect. Okay, so if we look at what's called the geoid anomaly, um, that's essentially a measure of gravity. And what you can see is that we have this kind of background for the ocean, this kind of light green, blue, yellowish stuff. And then we have a gravity high where the islands actually are. That makes sense because there's more mass here with there being land instead of water. And so you expect to have gravity high right along the island chain. But what you also see is this blue is a gravity low. And that's a trough that occurs and surrounds this what's called the Hawaiian swell. There's a big trough and it's similar to like lying on a water mattress where you kind of sink into it. And then you'll have a little little trough around yourself. And so the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian islands are lying on this mattress of, the, of the, the mantle of the earth, and it's kind of pushing down with all that weight. And so it creates this d big depression all the way around. And that's why it's so tr tricky to measure those, those, those uh, eruption rates, right? Here's a little bit more zoomed in view on the top right, kind of showing that, you know, it's kind of a little more pixely, but a little, a little more contrast here of how much the gravity is different there. And so I won't go into geoid any more than that. I won't get lost there. Uh, but there is, because uh, uh, there's a lot of other concepts to talk, to talk about. So we talked about the that plume possibly dragging as a hotspot moves, as a hotspot uh, is dragged by the moving plate above it, right? And so uh, by, by one study, by Lee et al, in 2004, this lithosphere, a sphere being in this more fluid part below it, that boundary underneath the Hawaiian Islands seems to have been eroded. So it's actually shallower over under Kauai than it is over here under the Big Island. And so the idea is that this plume is actually wearing, somehow altering or pushing up some combined effect of it, wearing away at and pushing up this whole crust over here as it's doing that, right? And then kind of the outside is where you have that trough of it where it, where it kind of accumulates. So a lot of stuff going on in there. And this has been termed the, the lithospheric washboard for uh, those of you guys who are more geology nerds that would like some, something to throw around. The lithospheric washboard is one of those. All right, so now we're going to turn to to trying to figure out um, what, what the hotspot actually is beyond just the surface. Look, look, look a little deeper into the Earth. But to do that, we have to look at earthquakes, and we're going to really, really briefly touch on this travel time graph idea of how, how we've actually discovered uh, some of the interior of the Earth. You know, some, of the, some of this is really the whole Earth story rather than just the Hawaii story, so I kind of have to step back, and uh, we're going to get a little bit more big picture here for you guys. But the idea basically is that if there's an earthquake at some, at some place on Earth, then you'll have those waves will travel through the Earth and arrive at different distances away from that original location at delayed times. So it takes less time for it to go here than it takes for it to go there. So you can kind of map time on one axis and distance on the other axis, right? And kind of see uh, there actually are on this plot three kinds of waves, P waves, S waves, and surface waves, right? If you can imagine a slinky, a P wave is like if you're holding a slinky on the end of it and you're sending a shock wave through like in the same direction as it's coiled, right? The, the S wave, it's back and forth. And the surface wave would be some kind of rolling up and down motion kind of thing, right? Um, 
that goes along a surface. The surface waves going along a surface, right? And P, wave, P and S waves both going through the media right through here. But because they vibrate in different directions, that means they travel different speeds. So let me play this animation here of a simulated earthquake. This is another IRS animation. You can kind of see the P wave traveling faster arrives first, and the S wave arrives second. So you actually have this line of P waves, and a more delayed, with a growing gap, line of S waves, and a more delayed, growing gap of surface waves. Right, that's kind of the, the easier first step of it. Right, that's kind of what we're working with here. And what happens when you have a boundary is that you have Snell's law comes into play. You have, here is a little slit of light, and it's shining on, on this boundary right here. And you have part of the light's getting refracted. It's coming out at an angle. That's what refraction means. And it's getting reflected as well. Right? So uh, light is a wave, just like seismic waves. And seismic waves show this the same property, actually, right? And so it turns out that when you have core layers, an outer core and an inner core, you have those first waves actually bounce off, or they will refract, th refract through, and then come out the other side and refract again, or they'll go through, refract in, bounce off, refract out, refract again, or they'll go through, go through, go through, go through, go through, all the way out the other side. You can have all these different paths, and all these different paths are kind of termed with different uh, terminology, right? So instead of just a P wave, when it goes into the into this outer core region, it becomes a PK wave. Then if it hits the core again, it becomes a PKI. If it hits the mantle again, that's a PKIK. If it hits the, the mantle again, it's a PKIKP. Or it reflects and it's a PCS, or it's a SCS. And so yeah, without going through all those details, there's all these different predicted dispersions of any earthquake wave. And so here's a plot from 6.7 Northridge earthquake and all the distances all the way to not quite 180 degrees across the Earth, but close to 160 degrees or so across the Earth. You can see that exact P wave, but you also see the PP wave, and you see the PKP wave, and you can see all these other waves that are embedded in here. And so that's how we've learned what the structure of the Earth actually is, is from how long it takes a wave to get down there and whether it bounces off or not, and how deep it bounces off. That's where the, all I, this information, because we can't see the core, we can't see these different layers, right? But we know how the earthquake waves behave moving through it. Now, interestingly, the S waves can't go through liquid. You can't shear a liquid. So S waves disappear in the outer core, and that's how come we believe it's liquid. And then they reappear in the inner core because the P waves get refracted and they create some S waves also. That's kind of how it works. And so that gives us the kind of the view we need, but it takes kind of analyzing this kind of information. That's kind of the, the main study of seismology and structure of the Earth. Okay, so I kind of had to cover that first um, because that's kind of the, the, the background for what this story is all about because the story of Hawaii is a story of this whole structure of the Earth. And that's here and here essentially is that boundary about 2,900 kilometers down, 2,800 sometimes. That actually varies. Right? We've come to, come to find out because there's, it's not as simple as this, this most common USGS image right here. I'll show you guys some little bit more more evolved uh, publications that address what they might look like in more detail. But so what we can do is we can then look at the differences and what we expect. I wonder if I can step back. Yeah. So we can actually say, okay, so if my earthquake if earthquake wave didn't arrive at this exact time, but it was a little bit slower or a little bit faster, then let's map out those differences. And if we do that, that's what these maps are. And that whole process is called mantle tomography. And so what you see here is a bunch of slices from the outer core boundary of the Earth to the surface of the Earth. And they've got depth here on the right. This is showing 410 kilometers, 660, and 1,000. And what you, show, what you see here on the bottom, you can kind of see 
the axis of blue to red is 1.5 slow to 1.5 fast. So 1.5% faster is a stuff colored in blue, and 1.5% slower is a stuff colored in red. And if you start looking at these images, and these in particular are taken over uh, different parts. This is Marianas Trench. This is the North Kuril Islands. This is West Java. This is East Java. Tonga, Chile, Peru, Kermadec Islands, right? All different parts of the Pacific, right? You can kind of see what might be a familiar pattern if you've studied, uh, studied geology, which is it looks like an ocean plate actually getting bend, bent down into the crust there. So if you have ever seen this kind of diagram before, where we have our different basic plate boundaries, we have our divergent boundary where the ocean's kind of spreading to the sides there and there, and we have our subducting plate where the oceanic crust is going underneath a continent, for example. And you can kind of see it intact off of the image. Well, there was a reason I never drew what was below the image. We've been arguing about that for some time. Um, but we're actually seeing what, is, what amounts to like a CAT scan or like an ultrasound view of the inside of the Earth showing us these, these plates. So here's a kind of schematic. We actually can see not only these subducting plate material, which in some cases we'll see there's evidence for them actually going connecting all the way down to this is the core of the Earth here. Right? So actually coming up against the core. And in other areas which are much faster, which look like these mantle plumes, hot spots, if you will. Right? Big upwellings that kind of surround different parts of the core. Now the core is not that big, so you kind of, ha kind of have this whole map. This is kind of the whole map of it right here. You have two spots that are kind of big upwellings, and then kind of in between you have two spots that are big downwellings, and that's kind of the structure of the core. A present it has that kind of, you know, areas where stuff is piled in more and stuff where it's coming up more, just the, how the cycle actually goes. We've mapped, been able to map out through this kind of study that there is uh, ocean plates that go down and kind of flatten out. And sometimes they break apart and sometimes they just kind of penetrate and seem like they sink down further in and it's all kinds of crazy things you start seeing that you maybe didn't expect. So here's an example uh, from Tonga. Um, this is actually uh, very close um, to, this is the area where that 7.7 .7 earthquake occurred. Um, so I'll show a blow of that in a second here, but in this area over here, we actually have various versions of the plate. You actually have, have areas where you might see two plates stacked one on the other, depending on which cross-section line, which slice you go through, right? So we actually can analyze these things in 3D and it's kind of hard to visualize them in 3D. And so these authors have used origami to kind of illustrate what this actually looks like, taking a paper and folding it to show how you can have a, a, a slab going down actually with a tear in it and one part torqued one way overriding another part that's trapped below it and they're actually the same plate and this is a situation in Tonga Kermadec right in there so this is kind of zoomed into one one portion of it right in here the Kermadec arc and so I believe that earthquake today 7.7 .7 epicenter was somewhere right in there and I want to say it was only 10 kilometers deep All right so we're looking at our scale here 10 kilometers puts it Kind of right in here, and if you kind of look at this plot, these little white dots are all, all big earthquakes. And so there is a region of big earthquakes that's common kind of above this whole zone, right? Not only because the plate's going under, but because you have a big, a big squeeze happening right here. And all that motion ac accumulates into the plate. And that's essentially why you have these shallower adjustment earthquakes. But you also have these kind of deepening earthquakes that go down to this 660 kilometers down. So when you saw like the deep earthquakes in the last couple of years, even some big ones, they don't happen everywhere, but there are patterns of them happening in specific places, especially where you have these downwellings of these old ocean crusts, right? Still, still on a surface over here, but actually attached and bent downwards and then doubling up, piling up, being torn and bent. And that's the, the complexities of plate tectonics. So this is not quite Hawaii, but it's going to affect, this is all the stuff that's surrounding us here. We can do the same thing for Hawaii. So this is uh, six different views of what is the Hawaiian plume. So this is the core of the Earth here once again, and this kind of reddish area is the connection of heat, where the Big Island is top and center of every single one of these cuts. And so in some, some cuts it's not quite so connected, in other cuts it's a little bit better connected. 
Sometimes it looks like it kind of meanders, like maybe it's not connected, what's going on, maybe it's, it's drifting or blowing. And so, um, of course, since we have all these different ways to slice it, we can actually build these 3D renderings of it. So here we have six different cut, de cut depths from way, way down, 2,500 kilometers down, the base of this plume, kind of coming up, kind of behind my shoulder right here. And we kind of, uh, Hawaii is, is actually on here, I'm drawn on here, and right there. And here it is, 1,500, there's Hawaii. So you can kind of see a little bit of this little plume coming up right there, 1,000 kilometer depth. And 660, it's a little bit more visible under Hawaii. Easier to see. When you get to 440, it gets a little more muddled because you have a lot more shallow stuff going on over there, right? So, um, but that's kind of one way to kind of slice through it.